Better? Yes. Shall we pray? My Father, my God, I want to say thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the new week. Thank you for our lecturer. Thank you for all the rest of us, fellow, my fellow students. Thank you for the wisdom you are going to give us this week to carry out lectures. Be that glorified in the name of Jesus. Most precious Father, we commit our activities of this week into your able hands, lecture. Father, please preserve our lecturers, preserve all the students in the mighty name of Jesus and give us the wisdom and give us the knowledge to know more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, we'll get started. Um, so we've come a long way, actually, uh, in our topic on holiness. Uh, we started off by looking at the holiness of God. We spent two sessions on that. And then from there, we, having understood God's holiness, uh, we considered why we must be holy, why it is important for us to be holy. And then from there, uh, we have now come into these chapters which talk about how God makes us holy. So we saw a little bit of that last time. We saw that he is our Makkadesh, uh, you know, which has got that word Kadosh inside it. Uh, so it's basically Yahweh saying, I will make you holy. I will set you apart. Uh, so uh, the Lord takes that commitment upon himself. But of course, we are expected to cooperate with him uh, because he doesn't like to force us to do anything. He respects the free will that he has given us. So when we choose to submit and cooperate with him, he causes us to be made holy. Uh, he sets us apart for himself uh, in, you know, in, our, in our thoughts, in our actions, in all of that. So he empowers us. He helps us. So we started off by looking at that. Um, and today so we are going to be just, just continuing that today. Uh, we're going to be looking at how the Lord uh, perfects his holiness in us and the you know role that we play so we say that i'm sorry i'm just going to be having this cough i think um you know so uh, it's a kind of allergic thing uh, yeah so um <clears throat> yeah so uh, we uh, so we are looking at the same thing you know uh, about uh, the Lord empowering and us cooperating. But then there are so many scriptures, right? And they all present different aspects of this uh, thought. So uh, we would be going through so many scriptures. Uh, now, um, what we are covering today would be based on the chapters four and six of your uh, notes. Um, because um, five was already covered. Five is the chapter on why we must be holy. So we've already touched that. Uh, so today's session uh, would be based on chapters four and six of your notes. And uh, so, you know, you could go through that later uh, after the class, you know, just to kind of revise what has been, you know, covered in the class. So let's uh, begin with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And, you know, if someone could read all the way through to the next chapter, verse 1. So basically, I would like you to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, and uh, read all of those verses, and read up to uh, verse 1 of chapter 7. If someone could please do that for us, uh, then you know we'll uh, look at what this passage has to say, and then take it from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean things and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Okay, so... um. Uh, when we read these passages, we sometimes don't catch what is being said. 
simply because we have been reading these um, you know passages from childhood and we've kind of become um, i don't know <laughs> immune to what uh, is actually you know is being said in them uh, but actually if you look at what god is offering his people here you know he says in verse um, 16 he says i will live with them and walk among them and i will be their god and they will be my people it's quite an awesome uh, promise that he's making over here he says that he's going to come down uh, and he's going to live with his people he's going to walk among them he's going to get involved in their ordinary everyday lives uh, you know um, it's like this um, very rich very influential person who chooses to literally you know walk on a day to day basis uh, with ordinary people and get fully involved in their lives and be willing to help them at every point you know so that's like such a uh, big offer that god is making so he says i will live with them and walk among them i will be their god and he says i will you know i'm willing to choose these people as to be my people you know is the honorable privilege that he's giving and then um, he he says you know therefore that's why because i am willing to do this come out from them you know come out from the uh, from that uh, community of unbelievers that you are living among and be separate touch no unclean thing and i will receive you so the only condition that he is putting is that we should be uh, willing to be on his side after all that he is offering you know if we say no no we want to be on the other side and we want to continue you know behaving the way the unbelievers do and touching all the unclean things which they touch then it would be rather pointless it's like as if we are rejecting the offer that god is making us and it's not just this offer that is making of you know uh, being this noble rich benefactor who's coming down to help a poor bunch of people no he's going one step further because in verse 18 it says i will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters says the lord almighty this almighty lord is not just saying you know i'm going to be nice to you people because i feel sorry for you he says i'm willing to go all the way and actually adopt you into my family as my own children you know i mean like that's the ultimate privilege that he can give uh, to to people and uh, so paul says over here in verse 18 therefore since we have these promises dear friends let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit so let's purify ourselves you know let's separate ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit uh, perfecting holiness out of reverence for god so god is making an offer like this and he had to you know sacrifice his son uh, to to fulfill this promise so when such a promise is being given the least that we can do is you know um accept this offer and reverence the god who has done this for us and you know separate ourselves uh, so that uh, nothing contaminates our body and spirit so this is what we would need to do out of uh, gratitude out of respect uh, for god who is offering us this okay so um, that's the point that is being made over here um, so generally we would expect god in his holiness uh, to come down to either judge us or we would expect him to come down you know uh, to take some action against us uh, and of course he would never certainly condone our sins but here he is saying i am i am willing to adopt you as children and give you a chance to be a different kind of people to be a pure and holy people just like me so he is making this offer and saying see here i am uh, giving you a second chance to be a different kind of people and so you cannot be a different kind of people if you're still yoking yourself with the unbelievers you know once you um, i mean when we look at the oxen in the in the fields and they are yoked together those two oxen have no choice but to move in the same direction right uh, so if we yoke ourselves with unbelievers we would have to be you know we would end up walking in the direction that they are walking we would end up uh, indulging in the things that they are indulging in and so if you if that is the kind of yoke which you have chosen to take upon yourself then how on earth can you you know separate yourself 
how on earth can you keep yourself from contaminating your body and spirit? And uh, so it's out of the question. It doesn't work that way. So you would have to unyoke yourself. It would have to be a deliberate step, a conscious step that you would take to no longer uh, you know, be part of all of that and to consciously separate yourself from such people and say, no, I cannot, I can, I can be your friend, but I cannot be your friend to the extent where I am participating in all of that. So um, that would obviously bring a rift in that friendship. You would probably lose that friendship. So this is going to happen, you know, in, in our um, in our business associations, partnerships. If, if the other person is kind of dragging us into something where we would have to compromise our principles, then uh, we would have to back off and say no, which means, in fact, you would, it would affect your very you know um, business, your finances. So there are serious uh, repercussions. But this is something that we choose to do because the God of gods, the Almighty One, has said, I won't just be your benefactor. I will, in fact, adopt you as my own family members. So for the sake of that honor, we choose to give up all of these other things. So um, what are some of the things that could contaminate our body, our flesh? That would basically be the words that we speak, the actions you know, that we uh, perform, uh, basically our choices. So that would um, uh, it would stain, it would contaminate our body, our flesh. On the other hand, what contaminates the spirit? You know, what contaminates the inner person? Uh, that would be wrong attitudes, wrong passions and desires. Uh, that would you know uh, contaminate the inner person. So we would need to separate ourselves from these things consciously, uh, so that we can be pure out of reverence for this God who has chosen to walk among us and live with us and be part of our everyday lives. Okay, So this is a commitment that we make to him. Um, and so in line with that, you know, Romans 15 verse 16 uh, says this. If someone could read out for us, Romans 15, 16, please. Romans 15, 16, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so mm -hmm. the, the offering that these Gentiles are making will be acceptable to the Lord. It will honor the Lord only if it is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit wants to sanctify us so that whatever we are offering will be pleasing in God's eyes. It will be acceptable to him. Uh, but we need to you know, cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that this kind of sanctification takes place. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is willing to help us break out of any and every kind of yoke. Uh, we don't have to continue being yoked to the unbelievers. We don't have to be continue being yoked to the world. He has the power. He has the wisdom to bring us out of absolutely any kind of spiritual bondage. You know, whatever stronghold of temptation is there in our lives, uh, however intense it may be, however many years it might might have you know held its reign over us, uh, the Holy Spirit has the power to break us free, to set us free. I mean, there is no even no doubt even regarding that. All that is required is us taking those initial baby steps and you know saying yes lord i really want to give up these things now lord even as i start trying you help me so you need to put in that effort and make those attempts and even as you're doing it the holy spirit who sees that you're not just saying the words but are also in action actually trying and when he sees that he takes over he begins to guide he begins to lead he begins to empower but if you're uh, but if i uh, you know i am just simply saying the words again and again and saying yes lord i want to give up this i want to give up this but i'm not taking any steps to separate myself i'm not cutting off those things i'm not giving up those things then it would just be words but god looks for action not just words when he sees the action when he sees us making that attempt then he you know he uh, acknowledges that 
uh, what we are saying is genuine, that we really are serious about cooperating with him. And even as we take those first initial steps of cutting off all those you know, trigger points that lead us back into sin, separating ourselves from the people who um, you know, lead us into sin, even as we actually start taking those actions, he knows that we are serious about this. And then he will empower us. He will help us. And that is why, you know, um, in Romans chapter 7 uh, and, and the very beginning of uh, Romans 8, where, you know, Paul is talking about his past life. Um, you know, in the book of Galatians, uh, when he's talking about his past life, he says that as far as the Mosaic law was concerned, he kept it in a faultless manner. I mean, that's a very, very high statement to make about oneself. Uh, the Mosaic law had 613 laws. And um, uh, so at least outwardly, here was this man, Paul, who was very, very sincerely trying to keep all of them to the extent that it's possible to keep them externally. You know, internally is another matter because you see your emotions are involved and your motives are involved and all of that. And God can look inside and see that you've broken all the laws as at the, at the level of the spirit. So you, it's easy to keep the, you know, it's no, it's it's tough to even keep the letter of the law, um, but it's impossible to keep the spirit of the law without the Holy Spirit's help. But here was this man, Paul, who really had been trying to do that. And so, you know, I mean, in, uh, everyone would be reading this letter that he's sending out. So if he was bluffing about it, you know, someone would uh, be able to point a finger at him and say, ha, I know on that, I know on that occasion, I know what you did and the way you behaved. And so I know, I know that you really have not kept the law as faultlessly as you're pretending to be. But you see, no such uh, um, uh, allegations could be made against Paul because that man, when he was an unbeliever, he really faultlessly tried to keep those 613 Mosaic laws. But on the inside, this is the story that was going on. I mean, externally, anyone looking at him, you know, he says, right, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. As in, I was a better Pharisee than all the other Pharisees combined. You know, these are very high words that he's speaking about himself. And uh, so in, in public, that is who he was. But internally, there was this other story going on, which only he knew about. And he was so deeply ashamed and so deeply um, struggling. Uh, and uh, so maybe we, you know, we could actually look at those verses. So we, we would need to start off in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. And, uh, you know, if you could go all the way up to chapter 8, verse 2. So uh, Romans 7, 21, all the way up to 8, 2. If someone could read out, please. Romans chapter 7, verse 21. So I find this law at work when I want to do good. Evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in a sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Jesus Christ, the law of spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, so um, he talks about uh, what was going on inside, because you see on the outside, uh, you know, he would not express his hatred and anger towards people. Uh, you know, he would maybe be polite. Because the Mosaic law says, you know, uh, don't call somebody a fool, um, don't murder anyone. But on the inside, this hatred literally boiling, this anger that he has no control over, this all of these emotions, and he has no, and he knows that these are all uh, dirty in God's eyes, and he's unable to deal with it because uh, he says, in my mind, I really want to serve God. You know, I want to delight in the in the law, but. I'm unable to. It's like as if something is controlling me and I'm so helpless, you know, he says. And so in verse uh, 24, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me? And then he says in verse 25, no, Jesus Christ did that for me. He rescued me. And he goes on to explain how Jesus Christ did that. 
so in uh, chapter 8 verse 2 he says um you know jesus christ introduced this new law of the spirit and this new law of the spirit was able to set him free from this other law that had been you know uh, controlling him and um, uh, been subjecting him and so uh, it is the law of the spirit which sets us free which gives us victory and uh, so in romans chapter 8 ephesians chapter 5 and galatians chapter 5 he expands on this uh, he explains to us um, what exactly he means what exactly is this law of the spirit and how does it set a person free uh, you know from uh, from from sin and temptation and allow us to have, walk in victory so obviously we cannot look at all of those chapters in detail uh, but just to look at a couple of verses from galatians um, maybe if uh, you, we could first read out galatians chapter 5 verse 16 if someone could read out You know, is anyone present? <laughs> is anyone yeah. attending? Yeah. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Okay, so uh, one uh, instruction that he gives is live by the Spirit. Okay, is what he says. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll look at that in greater detail. If we could also read out chapter 5, you know, Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 25 galatians 5 22 to 25 galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 25 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit Okay, so um, uh, this person, this wretched man of you know Romans seven twenty four, where he calls himself a wretched man because he's so helpless. He longs to be some some somebody different, but he's caught up in the slavery to sin and is unable to escape. So now you know now that he's had his encounter with Jesus, um, and now that he's become a believer, he makes a simple decision. He decides, you know. Um, that he will now onwards walk in step with the spirit. That's what it says. So I know in verse um, 25, he chooses to walk in step with the spirit. That just basically means, you know, on a day to day basis, he's just going to listen to the Holy Spirit's voice and he's just going to submit and obey uh, all that the Holy Spirit is asking him to do. And uh, uh, why why does he know he will be able to do this why does he understand that he will be able to walk in step with the spirit earlier he couldn't but now uh, why does he know that he will be able to do it now because you know uh, because of romans 6 6 and we covered that already in last in the last class so now because of romans 6 6 he knows that uh, the old person that he was that wretched man that he was that wretched man thankfully got crucified with christ that wretched man got kicked out. Now, a new creation has been created by the Holy Spirit, given birth to by the Holy Spirit himself. And he is that new creation now. And so now he knows that he will be able to walk in step with the Spirit. He will be able to obey all that the Holy Spirit is telling him to do you know, on a daily basis. Of course, in the beginning, you know, I mean, uh, in the, the initially, uh, he would probably fall more, just like a little baby that's learning to walk. You know, it um, uh, keeps plopping down onto the ground because it's still learning the art of walking. So, but as time goes by, you know, the spirit continues to teach and uh, the person is able to learn. So he, uh, he has um, now successfully started walking in step with the spirit because now he's a new creation. He has the freedom to choose how he's going to walk, in which direction he's going to walk. He's no longer that wretched man who got crucified. So, um, so every day on a daily basis, as a new creation, he chooses to offer his body uh, to, to the Lord for righteousness rather than offering his body to 
uh, sinful things. So on a daily basis, he makes a choice to act out verse 24, Galatians 5, 24, where it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So because he knows that that wretched man was already crucified and that wretched person died, and now he is a new creation because he knows that. So each time, you know, his unrenewed mind comes up with his wrong, sinful passions. He takes those passions and he nails them to the cross and says, no, I don't need to be under your control anymore because I am now a new creation. He nails those uh, sinful passions of his unrenewed mind. He nails them to the cross and he continues to renew his mind. He teaches his mind the word of God and says, look, this is what the word of God says about what I should think and how I should respond to this particular temptation. So I will not give in to you. I am now empowered to live a different life. So I can uh, you know, uh, live a different life and enjoy the full rewards of that. I don't have to be this helpless person who's stuck in a situation and unable to come out. God can now freely bless me because you know there are no obstacles in the way and I'm doing what God wants. So he, on an everyday basis, he chooses to nail these uh, passions which rise up because you know the mind is still not completely renewed. So um, he every time the unrenewed mind comes up with some sinful thought, some sinful attitude, he takes it, he nails it to the cross. And in this, it's the same with even uh, the, the fleshly desires of the body. So every time those things arise, he takes that and he nails it to the cross. So by doing that, he is consciously choosing to walk in step with the Spirit. So this is what he is doing from his side. And when the Holy Spirit sees him doing that, you know, um, it says, we saw that earlier, right, in Galatians 5.16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Okay, and again, that same thing is repeated in verse 25, Galatians 5:25 it says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit who sees this person cooperating with him, he begins to empower him to live by the Spirit. So now this person is no longer just doing this on his own. He's being empowered by the Lord, by his divine power to be able to walk in victory. Uh, and uh, so we are not just commanded to walk in step with the Spirit. We are commanded to do that because the Holy Spirit himself is causing us, uh, equipping us, you know, enabling us to do that. So we, we, we are not walking in our own strength. We are walking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So uh, that is the teaching that comes out of these verses. And uh, uh, so... No believer has to say to themselves, "Oh, this particular stronghold that has a, that has that you know that has got its um, you know claws into me, I can never ever overcome it." No, there is no such thing. Um, every single temptation, every single uh, sin and stronghold can be broken. It's just you who have to step out in faith and just start taking those initial baby steps. And even as you're doing that, uh, you know uh, the Lord will help. And um, um, actually, in uh, Galatians chapter 6, we also have these instructions given uh, where it talks about how uh, there are some burdens that are too big to bear on our own. And so uh, fellow believers are instructed and said, when you see someone struggling with their sin, it's your responsibility to go and help them. It's your responsibility to stand by their side, you know, to uh, to to encourage them on a day to day basis, to pray for them, help them, you know, in this fight which they are fighting to, you know, overcome those strongholds. So uh, I'm not saying that this is something that we would need to do on our own. Uh, you can prayerfully find one or two persons, you know, um, uh, who will be willing to invest their time and you know their prayers and their love and their help. You know, in help in in guiding you and helping you to overcome. Uh, so sometimes there are things which you can do on your own with the help of the Spirit. Uh, but there are sometimes where you would have to reach out to other mature believers, wise believers who will be able to help you and guide you in doing this. And so even as they stand with you, uh, you know, 
you can overcome these things there is nothing no stronghold that can't be broken i mean because i've had uh, things in my life where, where i thought i would never come out of them and then uh, just many years ago someone just gave me uh, this tiny little sticker you know which you can stick on your i mean on the wall on your mirror or wherever and it just said it, it, it was this verse you know which says he is able and then every time my eye would catch that verse he is able i would think yeah he is able to bring me out of anything you know um physical things are easier in the sense you know we don't we don't we're not exactly that kind of people who will go and do physical acts of sin but the attitudes the inner attitudes my goodness it's quite difficult to come out of those uh, you know because we they, that's the way our mind has been functioning from childhood so for that unrenewed mind to be renewed uh, it's something that only it can happen through the you know help of the holy spirit and you have verses like that which says he is able he is able to you know equip us and help us and uh, so there is absolutely no stronghold uh, that you can't come out of god really um, has the power and he has the wisdom to know how to do it and so when we take our baby steps in his direction and choose to walk in step with him he will enable us he will equip us and he will empower us because that is his desire to sanctify us so that we can be offered as a acceptable offering to the father so god is for us in this he's very very much on our side and he's capable and able so we can have that confidence that uh, we will receive the strength which we need and uh, so we have in, in, in john chapter 15 uh, verses 3 to 4 Uh, this is what the lord says in fact you know we 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 looked at this um, uh, these verses last time in the last class but just as a reminder if you know one of us could just read out read it out once again john chapter 15 verses 3 to 4 please john chapter 15 verse 3 and 4 you are already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me okay so uh, we we touched upon this already we looked at how when we chose to believe in jesus words and we chose to accept him as our savior uh, that was enough at that time we were completely cleaned okay but we go to him on a daily basis for um daily cleansing that is something that we'll have to so that's how we remain in him every day those um those uh, those evil passions of the mind uh, those bodily desires which go against god's commandments you know whenever we give in to them we quickly go to him we say lord you clean me you purify me from my uncleanness and lord you strengthen me and make me more righteous in my walk so on a daily basis we keep going to him and as we do that the our connection to the vine gets stronger and stronger we are no longer one of those branches which is a kind of you no know, loosely connected to the vine and kind of hanging off and barely surviving no the more we keep going back to him uh, you know the more we get strengthened that connection keeps getting stronger and uh, then we really begin to bear the fruit of the holy spirit Uh, there's only one single fruit which we bear because uh, in galatians chapter 5 verse 22 it says that we bear the fruit of the spirit it, it doesn't say fruits it's not plural there's only one single fruit which we begin to bear and that fruit has got all kinds of lovely things inside it it's got love joy peace it's got gentleness self control faithfulness all of those things um so basically it all those things are your the nature of god the very nature of god you know because uh, the whole plan of us becoming believers was so that we would be made into the image of jesus christ so uh, when that connection to the vine gets stronger and stronger because daily we are going to him for cleansing we are abiding in the vine we are attached to him even as we are doing that this fruit starts growing what is that fruit that fruit is literally the nature of jesus christ so all of his love his faithfulness his self control starts being produced in us and that fruit starts showing and people can see that we have it and they think oh wow i think this is one person who's actually connected strongly to the vine the connection is strong 
you know so uh, uh, that is the external evidence of whether actually you're, you're properly connected to him or not so if you don't see this fruit in your life uh, you know and um, um, you see yourself lacking in this fruit in this nature of jesus christ then you need to ask yourself what can i do to strengthen the connection are there something standing in the way do i need to get rid of some things and and increase the connection you know that's a, that's some uh, that's a question which we would need to ask ourselves uh, that's why jesus says you know in john 17:17 17, 17, if someone could read out john 17:17 17, 17. John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So how does God sanctify us? How does he help us to remain in him? Um, he sanctifies us by his word. Very faithfully, he gives us the word. Uh, you know, every day he speaks to us. He points out verses to us. Uh, now it's up to us to believe whether it is truthful or not. Okay, so... We can say, no, 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 what God is saying is not really true, you know, and then uh, it's not really going to work out this way. So I need to do things from my side. I need to compromise from my side to get on in life because I can't just rely upon this word of God. The word of God is not, uh, uh, it, the word of God functioned very nicely in Abraham's day, but here we are living in the 21st century. In the 21st century, the word of God doesn't function in the same way. It's not truthful enough. And we come up with all this, you know, when we come up with all these wrong arguments and we ref refuse to accept that this word is truth, 101% truth. If we fail to do that and we fail to hold on to it, then we fail to get sanctified. So actually, it is very, very vital. You know, it says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth truth it's the truth of his word that is going to sanctify you and make you holy if you can just hold on to that word and say i believe in this word a hundred percent and i believe it to the extent where i'm going to act it out i'm going to put you know i'm going to um, obey it i'm going to follow it because i really believe that whatever this word is promising is hundred percent truth so most of um uh, you know satan's um, schemes and strategies will be to cause you to doubt the word it will be to cause you to um, you know um, be um, casual in your following of it you know so you may think okay fine if I you know just follow this word of God to 70% extent then you know uh, it's not so bad if I you know just kind of ignore his word for about 30% uh, it doesn't work like that. So he tries to make us compromise. So Satan's main tactic is either to make us completely disbelieve what God is saying, or at least just to kind of just believe it half-heartedly. Where we are like, okay, fine, I'll follow it when it's convenient, the word, you know, I'll follow the word when it's convenient. When it's, when it's too inconvenient, I'll just kind of ignore it because what God is saying over here is like too tough. And he's saying he'll bless me and you know uh, he will uh, you know sanctify me, but I don't see that happening. I mean, uh, when is it going to happen? I don't have the strength to hold on. And we start making all of these excuses. It doesn't work. Uh, we don't get sanctified. So it um, it all comes down to really 101% just believing in his word, believing that it is the truth and holding on to it. Because what, what he has promised in his word shall come through. You know, we will be uh, greatly blessed in him. So... Um, that is the main uh, problem, you know, that happened with Adam and Eve. Uh, they doubted God's word uh, and um, not sure whether we should, in fact, be taking time to, you know, get into that. But I think there's something very um, fundamental that we, you know, learn from that Adam and Eve story. Uh, so Adam and Eve failed. And uh, when they failed, Things just went disastrously for them. And now we, through Jesus Christ, uh, have been restored. So what Adam and Eve lost, that has now been restored to us. So it would be very, very foolish for us to once again repeat the mistake made by Adam and Eve. Okay, so the first humans who were created, literally in the image of God, uh, they 
were very very foolish they did some very very foolish things by you know because they did not believe in the 100% truth of god's word and just hold on to it they failed to do that and they lost what uh, you know what had been given to them now jesus christ has restored that to you and me so now we should not go back to uh, the mistake which they made so even though it's going to kind of eat into our time maybe we need to look at this so um let's you know look at these uh, familiar verses uh, if someone could read out genesis chapter 1 you know we're starting with genesis chapter 1 if someone could read out verses 26 to 28 Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Okay. Ah, yes. So, you know, you're supposed to rule over a whole bunch of things, basically sure. all of creation. Um, then if we can move into verse 28. 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. These people, look at them. I mean, what is God saying about this uh, Adam and Eve? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So these Adam, this Adam and Eve are literally like God. Okay, they're already like God. He literally made them in his likeness. It, he, they can't be any more like him if they, if they wanted. They're already like God. And because they are like God, they have been created to be rulers. And so in verse 28, we see that they are told to, you know, just go ahead and subdue the whole earth. They've been given the authority and the power to do that. So they can just subdue the whole earth and rule over it and have dominion over it because they have literally been made to be like God, literally in his image. That is their status. And here we have in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 to 6, where Satan comes in and he's causing them to doubt what God has given them. So if we can look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 to 6, if someone could read out, please. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 to 6, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the women. For God knows that when you eat, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasure and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Yeah. So uh, here we have Satan bringing in his lie. And what is the lie that he is saying? He's saying, you guys are not really like God, which is a complete lie because God himself said, I'm going to make them in my likeness. And now here is Satan saying, no, you're not really like God. You will become like God when you know good and evil. Okay, and you, you still don't know it. And you'll only know good and evil when you eat this fruit. Then once you know that good and evil, then you will be like God is what he is saying. You know, uh, so he's basically twisting the truth. OK, so um, and uh, but if you look at Adam, he already had enough wisdom and knowledge to, in fact, name all of you know creation. God brings all of those, uh, you know, created beings to him because after all, he's the ruler. Right. So he gets to decide what they're going to be named. And this ruler whom, whom God has created is so much in God's likeness that he is able to name them correctly. And the naming is done so correctly that God accepts whatever names he has given. So here is a man of stature. Adam is not no ordinary guy. You know, he's not just the you know caretaker, uh, uh, you know, one, one small little guy. He's the ruler. And he gets to name these creatures uh, because uh, they are going to be his dominion and he is going to be their ruler. So he's already wise. He's already like God. And now Satan is bringing this new idea that no, 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 you don't really know enough to be like God. You still don't have that knowledge. And so uh, Eve thinks, ah, you know, this uh, particular fruit, it seems to be desirable for gaining wisdom. 
she already has all the wisdom she could possibly need but now she's falling in you know and giving into this lie which satan is kind of placing before her and so uh, she you know decides i'm going to eat this i want to gain wisdom i want to be like god very sad because they already have all of that and they're thinking that if they do something sinful they will get it they already have it and they don't even realize it and uh, so um, you know uh, she eats it and then she offers it to her husband her husband there's no protest from him because which means he also is very much happy with the idea so he also eats it okay so they both do that and then uh, we have genesis chapter 3 verse 7 um yeah if someone could read out genesis 3 verse 7 please you know it would really help us to get along with the session and cover all of the thing if people could just you know read the verses it just kind of keeps you alert which is why i ask you to read because if i go on and on you know you, you may actually kind of you know tune out so this is just so if someone could please read out genesis chapter 3 verse 7 the eyes of both were opened and knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings okay so um, satan he said when you eat the fruit your eyes will be opened and you will know good and evil so their eyes were opened uh, but uh, what do they discover they discover that they are naked now basically what happened to satan is what is now happening to them okay so um um you know i mean now that we're actually into this let's at least grasp what's going on here so that you know we can keep this at the back of our mind and know who we are today in christ and stick to the truth okay and abide in him and not make the foolish mistakes you know which are you know first uh, human you know, fathers did so um ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 to 13 uh, if someone could read out Ezekiel twenty eight, twelve to thirteen. Son of man, take a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, "Thus says the Lord, uh, thus says the Lord God: You wear the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You wear in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering." The sadiest topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and yeah, 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 yeah. We'll we'll leave out the entire list of precious stones. Ah, uh, if ah, uh, you know, if you if you could read fourteen and fifteen, verses fourteen and fifteen. Cherub who covers, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at uh, verse twenty-eight, uh, verse twelve and thirteen, it you know here it's talking about the king of Tyre, but it's also talking about Satan. Okay, so there are two uh, um, because this king of Tyre seems to be literally embodied by Satan. I mean, I don't know. There's so much comparison between this man must have been a really evil man. So there's a lot of comparison going on between this king of Tyre and Satan himself. so uh, talking about satan it says you know you were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty and every precious stone adorned you that was the status which satan had you know a very very high status just the kind of very very high status that was given to adam and eve and it says in verse uh, 14 you were uh, in, it says you were anointed as guardian cherub for so i ordained you you were on the holy mount of god you walked among the fiery stones so um uh, lucifer was the guardian of the holy mount the same way adam was the guardian of this uh, you know uh, garden of eden uh, do you see the parallels going on over there so um and then it says you were blameless in your ways so lucifer was created perfect to be completely blameless just like adam adam was you know uh, created perfectly holy and um, then what happens verses uh, 16 to 18 if someone could please read out verses 16 to 
Ah uh, no, okay, fine. We'll take our break and we'll come back. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, we'll do this uh, after the break. So at eleven o'clock, you know, if we can all log log back in, uh, we'll we'll continue with our uh, session. Thank you. <laughs>